The Detroit Pistons of the later 80s and early 90s were unlike anything we'll see again in the NBA. Their over-the-top physicality polarized both fans and players, but it's that brand of basketball that earned them continued deep playoff runs, pitting them against the Goliaths of the league. Let's take a look back at how the bad boys came to be and how they collapsed after a few short years at the top. What's up everybody, you're tuned into Mad Hoops, bringing you the hottest NBA content on YouTube as usual, so let's get right into it. The 80s in the NBA were completely controlled by two names, Magic Johnson and Larry Bird. One of the two took home the championship eight years out of the whole decade. During this time, the Detroit Pistons were looking like quite a sad team at the start of it all. They finished with just 16 wins during the 80-81 season, earning them the second overall pick in the draft and getting the man that would help turn the entire ship around, Isaiah Thomas. Thomas was an undersized point guard at 6'1 and 180 pounds. However, his small frame was overshadowed by his large appetite for scoring and playmaking. But that wasn't the only overshadowing thing to show up during Thomas's rookie season. In 1981, Detroit traded for 6'11 Cleveland center Bill Lambeer. Lambeer would eventually become one of the key icons of the bad boy era. This is due to the fact that he was a loud mouth trash talker that did a lot more beyond the talking as well. He frequently towed the line between aggressive defense and being one huge safety hazard, throwing his body recklessly at opponents who dare drive into the paint. But this was all in the future. For now, the franchise was still struggling with what direction they wanted to take the team. The following year, Detroit would acquire Vinny the Microwave Johnson, a star in the six-man role who would unlock the offense for the bench unit the moment he touched a basketball. Johnson was a pivotal piece for the bad boys era, but again, the construction has not been completed. At the time, the Pistons were being led by all-star volume scorer Kelly Trapuca. The forward was drafted the same year as Thomas, and together the duo ran a run-and-gun type offense that emphasized everything but defense. They'd continually have one of the best offenses in the league, but sputter out in the playoffs due to their defensive woes. It makes the whole turnaround to what they would become even more insane. The man to kick off the metamorphosis came in 1983 and witnessed another failed high-scoring playoff run. Daly saw the pieces of a formidable defensive team, they were just a few guys short of fully making it click. Thankfully, in 1986, things were on the up and up. Joe Dumars was in his sophomore season and had blossomed into one of the best defensive guards in the league. The pairing of Thomas and Dumars turned into a devastating backcourt for any opposing guard. The Dumars experience, also coupled with the Kelly Trapuca trade for Adrian Dantley, meant the starting five in Detroit were a complete squad ready to start contending. They also had continued growth from Rick Mahorn that year. This allowed Bill Lampier to take breaks during the game from aggravating everyone in the arena and be comforted knowing there was still a big man down low trying to start physical altercations. They also drafted the one and only Dennis Rodman in the 1986 draft. Rodman was a prolific rebounder and defender of practically every position. He'd become one of the key pieces of Detroit's title runs later on, but for now, they still had to find their way to the finals. The following 1986-87 season, the defensive game plan had been activated, bruising big men down low with snuff-out attempts at the rim while simultaneously being sneaky effective on the offense. Lambeer would peak at 17.5 points per game, but his entire career he broke a mold that wouldn't get shattered until recent years. Bill was a floor stretcher. He didn't frequent three-pointers compared to today's standards, but for the 80s and early 90s, a center that can do both pick and roll and pick and pop is deadly. Meanwhile, Isaiah and Joe would pick up point guards beyond half court and throw traps and double teams around the three-point line. These perimeter actions are commonplace in today's NBA, but back then, it was a whole new thing, and opposing teams hated it. Most teams up to this point had traded in immediate hounding of the ball for running their guys back and setting up their half-court defense. This was partially to try and keep the pace of the game steady. Players could get into a flow for both teams and then hopefully play better. Too bad the bad boys could care less about keeping pace. They were ready every night to disrupt whatever flow you wanted to get into. Teams would frequently openly talk about not wanting to play the Pistons because of their overtly physical style. Legends such as Michael Jordan would credit Joe Dumars as being one of the best players to defend him, but still threw comments out about how little respect he had for the brand of basketball Detroit played. In the 87 playoffs, Detroit made it to the Eastern Conference Finals before being taken down by Bird and the Celtics in seven games. This would be home to one of the most iconic plays against the Pistons and encapsulated the high intensity at which both teams played. The Boston vs. Pistons rivalry during the late 80s was one for the books. It was a young hard nosed team versus a primed but aging cast of Celtics. 
It also signified just one of the legendary teams the Bad Boys were tasked with trying to take down. The following year in the 88 playoffs, the Pistons would overcome Boston in the conference finals and head at Magic and the Lakers in the finals. Although Magic would get the best of the Pistons, they had gotten to the mountaintop and they managed to take the champs to seven games. They had fought tough and nail to get to the finals and they kept bumping, grabbing, and diving all the way up to the end. After the 88 finals, the NBA released highlight mixtapes on VHS for each team. The Pistons one was impromptu labeled as Bad Boys by one of the NBA entertainment workers, and thus the nickname was born. With no qualms from the Bad Boys either, players like Bill Lambeer embraced the role of a villain. Isaiah Thomas would flash that charismatic smile in post-game interviews, but still walk onto the court and attack your favorite player the next night. The following two years would see the Pistons win back-to-back -back titles. In February of 1989, they traded Adrian Dantley for Mark Aguirre, a more connective piece on their defensive arsenal that could still steadily get his shot when the team needed a bucket. They would win 63 games that season. Once they hit the playoffs, they went through the declining Celtics, the up-and-coming Bulls, and the Lakers at the end. Then in 1990, they again trounced the Chicago Bulls in the Eastern Conference Finals and beat the Trailblazers in five. This was a transitional period for the Pistons in terms of rivals. In the beginning, it was Bird and the Celtics, but now a new legend was knocking on the door, MJ and the Bulls. The Pistons needed every bit of strength and cheap shots they had to continually get past Air Jordan. They had kept him down in the past years due to the creation of what they called the Jordan Rules, a simple game plan that was much more pure physical force than technically savvy defense. Basically, anytime Jordan would come inside the paint, the Pistons would swarm him, taking the idea of no easy bucket and earn him at the free throw line to a new extreme. As mentioned earlier, Jordan was very public about not respecting the Pistons play style. He felt it was completely unnecessary and a poor representation of the game as a whole. But still, each time the Pistons beat them in the playoffs, MJ walked across and shook hands with the Pistons. But in the 1991 Eastern Conference Finals, there was no handshaking to be had. Jordan and the Bulls were about to complete a sweep on the Pistons when all the team but the five on the court and Joe Dumars left and went to the locker room. Thomas, Lambeer, all of them, left before the game was over and did not give MJ his handshake for finally beating them. The NBA world took this as a major sign of disrespect and that was Jordan's last straw for the Pistons. After that, the bad boy era was effectively done. Chicago had begun their dynastic run and the aging Pistons stars had finally started to get banged up themselves after all those games. Bill Lambeer would retire during the 1994 season, followed closely by Isaiah Thomas in the offseason after suffering an injury to his Achilles tendon. The bad boy Pistons were a title contending team stuck in between the glory days of Bird vs. Magic and the bright lights of MJ and the Bulls, a team that had the talent, the drive, and the heart to compete with all of them, even if that meant ruffling the feathers of everyone watching. Peace.